When AIDS, or Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, first emerged 40 years ago, it was a mystery to doctors and researchers. Since then, it's killed more than 30 million people worldwide. The pace of that carnage has thankfully slowed, but HIV, or the human immunodeficiency virus that causes AIDS, is still out there, infecting another million-plus people every year globally. With us to help understand the progress that's been made to deal with it, we welcome, in Burlington, Ontario, Dr. Charu Koshik. She is an HIV researcher and immunologist at the McMaster Immunology Research Centre and a scientific director at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And in the downtown core of Ontario's capital city, Dr. Rupert Call, director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University Health Network and the University of Toronto. And we're very pleased that the two of you could join us on this important day on our annual calendar. I want to just start by taking a few seconds here and going through a bit of a fact file of red letter dates that have got us to this day. And we're going to start nearly 40 years ago, 1981, where the world first became aware that the rare immune deficiency disease among gay men and eventually injection drug users, AIDS, became first known. The year later, 1982, the disease is actually named Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome and is sexually transmitted or by blood transfusion by the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. And Canada, in that year, reports its first case. Fast forward to 1990, the antiretroviral drug AZT, AZT as they called it in the States, is approved for use in Canada. In 2005, point of care testing becomes available. Patients can get HIV test results in two minutes. In 2011, news of the so-called Berlin patient, Timothy Ray Brown, is the first person cured of HIV. In 2016, HIV preventative drug pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP for short, for individuals at high risk for HIV infection, that's approved for use in Canada. It's a bit like the birth control pill. You take it every day and it's 99% effective. And we should mention that there are currently 63,000 Canadians today living with HIV. Now, let's start with this. Um, as we suggested, it's been almost 40 years since we have become aware of this disease. A tremendous amount of money and research and efforts by the scientific community has been undertaken. And yet, there is still no cure. There is still no vaccine. Uh, Dr. Koshik, start us off here. Why has this disease proved to be so formidable? Uh, so thank you, first of all, for having me on this program. Uh, and then in answer to your question, there's multiple reasons. Probably at the top of the list would be the nature of this virus. It's probably one of the most uh, mutant, mutating virus. Uh, so in fact, uh, the virus mutates inside every person. Uh, once it gets in. So uh, it's proved to be very difficult because the part of the virus to which we need to get the immune system to respond uh, to kill the virus or deal with the virus is constantly changing. So it's very hard then to pin down what would it take to get a vaccine that actually looks and, and is able to neutralize all of the different types of viruses and the surfaces of the virus. So that's the problem with the vaccine. Dr. Cole, what would you add to that? And maybe I can suggest the following. Do you think there's been an adequate commitment by all of the world's resources in order to try to keep up with this disease and virus? Uh, it's hard to, I mean, I think uh, Dr. Korshik said, you know, completely right. The One of the challenges that I always say to my patients when they're saying, why don't we have a vaccine yet, is it's when you look at the history of vaccines, it's always hard to make a vaccine against an infection that we don't naturally make immunity to. So uh, HIV is quite different to many other infections where a small number of people may get a bad outcome, but many people who get that infection clear it and eventually wind up with immunity. HIV obviously is one of these infections where natural clearance of the virus and natural immunity does not appear to happen. Uh, and I think that that just says right up front that there's a biological barrier to making a vaccine that is going to be that much harder to make a vaccine. Hmm. So, uh, you know, I think that it's, we, we have had considerable resources put into HIV vaccine research in the past, nowhere near the amount that's been put into the, uh, uh, the COVID vaccine, for instance. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm always pushing and advocating for more resources. Uh, but it has been a challenge, and I understand that it's hard to maintain the, uh, the, the, the enthusiasm when it's taken so long to make a, a vaccine successfully. No, I take your point, but uh, can you follow up with this? It's, 
This is still a difficult disease to get, is it not? So HIV is, it, the research that I do in, in the lab is looking at HIV transmission. And HIV is quite fascinating in the sense that most of the time when you're exposed to HIV, uh, sexually, you don't acquire it. Uh, it's less than a percent of the times that you're actually exposed that you do acquire it. And so one thing that's very interesting is trying to understand what are the correlates of transmission of that virus. It's quite different to exposure to, to many other infections that we look at in, the, uh, uh, in, in microbiology and infectious disease. Right. Dr. Koshek, how about this? We, we did suggest earlier that Timothy Ray Brown and another patient from England were cured, which, um, you know, doesn't seem possible. How did that happen? So these were uh, sort of unique cases. Uh, before the London patient, the uh, Berlin patient, or Timothy Ray Brown, was the only known person who was uh, known to be cured uh, of the disease. And it uh, happened a little bit because of serendipity, because we didn't actually know that this was going to happen. But he also had cancers. And when they did a bone marrow transplant to deal with the cancer, knowing that he had HIV, they put in bone marrow cells that uh, uh, from a person who didn't have CCR5. So CCR5 is one of the molecules that cells need to express on their surface for HIV to get in. So without this uh, core receptor, uh, the virus cannot get in and cannot replicate. Uh, we don't understand all the nuances of why that would happen, because at that point, the virus would already have been in his body. But the fact of the matter is that after that, there was no more virus replication uh, in both these patients, which had exactly the same treatments. It doesn't happen with everybody, but it certainly happened in these two cases, that the virus could not be found anymore and wasn't able to replicate. So, Dr. Kashik, as opposed to leading or ushering in a whole new era of lots of people being cured, that was really, it, it just, it wasn't applicable going down the road. Is that right? Well, it's not applicable because it didn't work in everybody. And also because bone marrow transplant uh, is a very challenging uh, procedure in, in itself. It has lots of challenges and people have to be immunosuppressed. You know, so it's not scalable uh, in terms of applying that to millions of people. Hmm. Now, uh, I've heard this expression uh, Dr. Call, that some pe people who live with HIV are quote unquote functionally cured. What does that mean exactly? So I think there are lots of nuances in semantics when you get into HIV cure, right? And so uh, usually we talk about two types of HIV cure. We talk about a, a sterilizing HIV cure. If I have a sterilizing cure, that means my body now no longer contains any virus that could cause disease for me, that could, could be transmitted to somebody or that uh, can replicate. Uh, and then a functional cure means that I have a, a virus still in my body uh, that is able to replicate, but I'm controlling it usually without the use of medications. And, and so I think it's really important to point out that when we are looking at people who acquire HIV naturally, about one in 200 people, 0.5%-ish, uh, are what we would call an elite controller. And that is somebody who's able to maintain the level of virus down at undetectable levels, which is our goal when we are treating HIV infection with, with medications. They're able to maintain it at that level without medications. And so to some degree, that is already a functional cure that we see in about one in 200 people living with HIV. Now, that doesn't tend to be permanent. And we know that those people do almost all have replication competent virus in their bodies. Uh, and eventually, we tend to see disease progression in most people. Uh, but there is a, a substantial number of people, and there's very interesting research going on looking at correlates of that HIV functional cure without, without medications. Now, having said that, Dr. Koshik, uh, let's go back 30 years. The introduction of retrovirals, that was an absolute game changer in people, uh, for people who were living with AIDS. How so? So before that, I do this in my immunology 101 class when I'm talking about HIV. If you look at the graphs that show how many people were dying, it was tens of thousands of people that were dying. It was basically a death sentence. Uh, and then uh, early on, where there was promise of antiretrovirals, then one retroviral at a time was tried, which basically uh, stops HIV from replicating inside the body. Uh, and that didn't seem to work because the virus, as we talked about, we didn't know at that time in uh, late, uh, in early 1990s, 
the virus would mutate uh, and people would actually be sick with virus that couldn't be treated with the antiretrovirals. So then the uh, outcome of that was that at least three different antiretrovirals were put together so that there was no way for the virus to get out of that uh, in terms of the, the three antiretrovirals working together. Uh, and with that combination, the virus could no longer replicate. And that was a game changer. Because after that, within uh, weeks and you know, pretty much everybody within a year uh, controls the virus level to a point where it's undetectable. And again, uh, and 30... That has really led to the uh, HIV becoming a long-term chronic infection rather than a death sentence. Understood. And, and again, going back 30 years ago, Dr. Call, what kind of side effects would a patient on retrovirals be looking like at that time? So these regimens, when they came out, you know, again, Dr. Korshay is completely right. At first, we were using just the one medication, AZT. I think that was on your timeline there, mm -hmm. Stephen, at the beginning, 1990. So uh, when I was doing my training, which was back in the 90s, we were sort of adding one medication after another, uh, and people would still progress eventually and, uh, and develop disease uh, and die of, of AIDS. The reason why we were adding them one at a time was these medications are quite toxic. And... Uh, you know, AZT can suppress the bone marrow, AZT can change the fat distribution in your body, AZT has a number of uh, toxic effects, and the other medications that we were using early did too. So we had this mixture of quite toxic medications uh, that also, some of them had to be taken with food, some of them had to be taken certain times of the day. So it was a very complicated regimen, those early regimens that we were using. And Dr. And Paul, compare it, oh. forgive me, compare it to today, how, how do you treat differently today from back then? So today we still have the same broad principle, which is that most of the time we are combining medications together, uh, three, sometimes two, but usually three medications together. But those things now have much less in the way of side effects as medications, uh, and they can be co-formulated together and taken just once a day. So most of the time when I have a new patient in the clinic, I'm able to start that person on one pill a day and, uh, and maintain that person with just that one pill a day for the rest of their lives, which will be a fairly normal lifespan and which will be, I think, very different to the, uh, the, the life that would have been lived by somebody living with HIV 20 or, or 30 years ago in the sense that people have, there's even some very interesting model that suggests that uh, if I'm diagnosed with HIV today and start on medications, my life expectancy may be increased. I don't know that I completely believe this, but maybe increased above that of, of me without HIV, because not only do I have excellent medication, which is able to suppress the virus very well, but I'm going to be seeing the doctor more often, so perhaps I get other health care uh, that, that has health benefits and is able to prolong my life as well. I don't know that life will be longer, but I certainly think that life, will, life expectancy will be almost the same, uh, and there's much less in the way of stigma in the sense of... Uh, uh, the you know the transmission to my my unborn child is going to be minimized with the current regimen. Transmission to my partner is really prevented completely with current treatment. So that same treatment, if I am able to bring down the virus level to undetectable, that is going to prevent transmission to my partner to the point that Justice Canada uh, announced a few years ago that they no longer uh, recommend prosecuting cases where uh, patients do not where uh, a person living with HIV on treatment does not. Uh, 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 disclose their HIV status to their partner because there is no uh, real realistic chance of transmission. And so clearly the, the stigma and the, uh, the barriers that are faced by, pe by people living with HIV are much less than they used to be, although they are still substantial. Well, let me follow up with you on this because we talked again in the timeline at the beginning about PrEP, which is a, a preventative uh, form of medication and treatment. How, how exactly does that work? So PrEP is a, a simplified version of the same regimens that we use for treatment. So generally, the treatment that we, we give will be three medications. PrEP is often two medications given together, and one tablet called Truvada was the original PrEP. And essentially, usually we give PrEP continuously. So every day, I, I take one of those uh, pills every day. Uh, and if I'm able to do that, that reduces my risk of acquiring HIV if I'm exposed, not to zero, uh, but 95% uh, plus reduction in my risk of acquiring HIV. Uh, and actually coming down the pipeline probably in a few years will be even better regimens. Uh, there's some very nice data coming out at the latest uh, uh, World AIDS conference that an, an injectable medication given just once given just once uh, every couple of months uh, is even more effective than that daily pill. 
Uh, so I think that the way that we prevent and treat HIV, we have injectable treatments coming as well, is going to change quite a bit over the next few years. Dr. Koshik, I have to ask you this next question, which is, you know, the world knows a lot more about vaccines and diseases and viruses thanks to COVID-19. It is almost all we've been talking about for the last nine months. And yet here, you know, the, the AIDS community has been at this for 40 years. And it looks like we're going to have a vir uh, excuse me, a vaccine to COVID-19, you know, potentially within a year of its arriving on the scene. And 40 years later, you still don't have one for HIV or AIDS. And I guess I need to know how annoying that is for you. Well, so, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard uh, Dr. Fauci on uh, television because he's also an HIV vaccine researcher, you know, and you hear for nine months, most of us who've been, uh, you know, in the area of HIV vaccine and following that uh, progress very closely, uh, you know, we're very worried about how likely is it that a new virus uh, you know, could be dealt with in a in a form of uh, a, a potent vaccine, and, and at best, and even WHO, you know, for COVID nineteen, said if it's per fifty percent efficacious, we'll take it. Uh, considering you know the level of uh, of uh, death that's uh, occurring around the planet, so I I'm delighted. Uh, you know, I I always say to people that uh, if it were a pandemic flu, which we were quite prepared for, in fact, H one N one, we dealt with uh, you know very. Uh, very well because flu vaccines, we know exactly how to make them. And it was made and within months we got rid of uh, H1N1. This was a new virus that we didn't know anything about. Uh, and uh, given uh, the possibility that uh, it's an RNA virus, it could have gone the way of HIV, which is also an RNA virus, uh, and very difficult to formulate a vaccine against. But fortunately, we have gone the way of the flu rather than the HIV vaccine. So I'm happy that at least we won't be living in a pandemic for years and years. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, there are lessons to be learned. Uh, I have to say that the COVID vaccine, one of the reasons for its success is how much more we understand about vaccines based on HIV vaccine and its failures in last 30 years. So a lot of those lessons were carried into the COVID-19 vaccines, but now we can flip it around and see how much we can learn from COVID-19 vaccines to take the field of HIV vaccine forward. I do need to ask Dr. Call a, um, a difficult and uncomfortable follow-up question, which is, you know, anybody can get COVID. If you talk to somebody and, you know, the aerosol droplets are there, you can catch COVID that way. For a long time, particularly in the 1980s, uh, there was a strain of thought which said, uh, you're not going to get AIDS unless you're, um, unless you're uh, gay or you use intravenous drugs. And it was a way of saying, this is a disease that happens to them, but not to me. And I wonder if that is part of the reason why 40 years later, you're still looking for a cure. You know, clearly there's been a lot of stigma against HIV, and I think there's a lot of stigma against any infectious diseases. When you look at uh, TB, when you look at, at COVID, you know, the, the stigma against any of these infections. And uh, and we do see clear uh, differentials in, in uh, the, the incidence of infection in different communities around Canada. And whenever we have something like that, that can lead to stigma for any infection. Uh, I always love the fact that, uh, you know, when you, when you see somebody who is uh, having a baby, you say, oh, congratulations, uh, uh, on, on, you know, on becoming pregnant, which clearly involves having unprotected sex. And when you, when you see somebody who's acquired HIV, you stigmatize them and say, well, this must mean that you're, uh, 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 you know, you're, you're in some way immoral. I, I think that this is just one of the, the fallacies that's out there about, about HIV. But I, I do think that there are clear biological challenges to an HIV vaccine that we're realizing are not the same for a COVID vaccine. So, I, you know, I, I really think that they're inherently, it's a much more difficult vaccine to make. In many ways, I love the fact that we've been so successful with the COVID vaccine. I think it's probably going to boost uh, interest in vaccines for many infections. And I do think that the technology that's been used for the first couple of vaccines, at least, the Pfizer and the, uh, the Moderna vaccines, it's going to be very interesting to apply that mRNA technique potentially to an HIV vaccine. And I think uh, it'll be interesting to see if that, that could, in some ways, uh, bypass some of the barriers that we've had uh, uh, to HIV vaccines. And I'm, I'm sure there are, 
are, are clever people out there already trying that, that technique for an HIV vaccine. In which case, Dr. Koshik, how close are you to a vaccine for HIV or AIDS? So there's a number of uh, new uh, areas that are being explored for uh, you know new initiatives into HIV vaccine. Uh, one of the very promising areas is to uh, because we've learned from the lessons of uh, previous vaccines what doesn't work uh, is to actually try to formulate what are called mosaic vaccines. Uh, which where you don't take just one type of HIV vaccine, you take multiple parts of multiple types of HIV, uh, uh, HIV uh, portions, and you mix them together uh, so that there's protection against not just a single subtype of HIV, but multiple uh, HIV types. Uh, and those uh, vaccine trials are currently on, ongoing, uh, one in uh, sub-Saharan Africa for women, uh, and another one across uh, multiple countries, including North and South America, uh, you know, for uh, MSM, men who have sex with uh, men, as well as transgender people. So those are really, really promising. The uh, other really uh, promising uh, area in uh, vaccine research is um, uh, what we are calling passive immunization. So basically antibodies, which we know uh, they're called broadly neutralizing antibodies. That means they basically are capable of neutralizing a large spectrum of different kinds of HIV, which has been one of the problems. Uh, you basically take the those antibodies, artificial antibodies, and you put into people, uh, kind of like a passive, what the body can do on its own, you provide to the body these antibodies, and again, these can be given a few weeks apart, two months apart, to see whether you can continue to protect people over time. So not a traditional vaccine, but a different way of protecting people uh, in endemic areas or people who are at very high risk for acquiring HIV. So those are a couple of really promising areas. Uh, you know, for vaccine researchers, the work never stops. So as Rupert was alluding to, you know, the mRNA vaccine, different platforms of vaccine, many of the ones that that are being tried in COVID uh, are actually coming out of the HIV world where they've been tested and tried uh, in different kind of animal models and non-human primate models. So there's a lot of lessons learned there. Well, if the work never stops, I'd better let you get back to it. Dr. Koshik, Dr. Call, it's awfully good of both of you to join us on this World AIDS Day and bring us up to date with what you two and others are working on. Thanks so much. My Thanks pleasure. very much for doing the program, Stephen. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.